Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. So lovely to chat to you. Oh, lovely to chat to you. Where are you, where are you at the moment? Sydney? No? I'm in Melbourne? Sydney. I'm in my, uh, yes, Sydney, Australia. So in my office and I'm very disappointed with my background currently. <laughs> <laughs> like I should have some posters on my wife at least to make it look like I've been productive. I promise I have, but I've just been all productive here and not there. No worries. Um, so maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction to Ellie and Abby. Obviously, both written and directed the film. Um, so it must be something that's, you know, kind of a passion product, a uh, project of yours. Um, but maybe for people who don't know anything about the film, how would you first describe it? What can they expect if they're going to watch it? Um, Ellie and Abby is a teen rom-com with both a queer and paranormal twist um, is how I like to describe it. Um, so it's, you know, is a love story between Ellie, high school Ellie, who's realised that she's fallen in love with a girl in her class, Abby, and wants to ask her to the formal. And so this um, acknowledgement of her queerness for the first time um, triggers her aunt, who was a lesbian in the 80s and died before Ellie was born, to come back and basically she would call it help her as a fairy godmother, but I think Ellie sees it as, like, haunting her as her fairy godmother to try and teach her the ways of gay life but unfortunately her you know her advice is all based from when she was alive in the 80s so most of it is outdated and awkward and very clunky and what inspired you to you know write and you know create the film in this very specific way because of course you know we've seen so many um high school teen movies over the years most of them perhaps coming from hollywood coming from america um, so what made you want to take on this genre, but then tell this very specific story about coming out and then also comparing notes, I suppose, with the older generation who might have faced um, a different environment, you know, when they were trying to come out back in the 80s, though? Yeah, absolutely. That's a big part of it. So I wanted, I mean, that thing of representation of like wanting a high school, a rom-com, because I loved rom-coms growing up. It's my favourite genre. And what I really noticed is that, you know, rom-coms I could go to a cinema and watch with my mum. Like we could go and do that together. But most of the, you know, kind of gay cinema out there or queer cinema out there that I really loved, I would have to watch it by myself in my bedroom. You know, it's that, that kind of thing that it, keeps you hidden mm -hmm. you know so like if particularly if there's a part of yourself that's already a bit hidden mm -hmm. like through your content that's something you have to hide as well and so it was very important to me that when I told a story like this that it was a family film like it was a film you could watch as a family because whilst there's so much excellent LGBTQIA content starting to come out now, mm -hmm. um, which is really wonderful. I, there, you know, particularly when I wrote this story, there was a huge gap when it came to family-friendly content. Um, so that was that was one big driver for it. And then the other was just realizing that, I mean, I was someone I I had a very lucky you know experience. I was very lucky to have very supportive parents and you know, the first real struggle that I really experienced other than like, you know, casual homophobia from people or friends had dropped off, which did happen. But the biggest painful struggle I felt was during, we had a marriage equality um, big debate in Australia, you know, in 2017, we didn't have marriage equality in 2017. And it was a big public debate and it was so dreadful and at the time I was writing because Ellie and Abby started as a play mm -hmm. and I was in the process of adapting it to the film and it very much was a much more simple rom-com then it was like the aunt character was still there but it was very funny and it was basically the story of how Ellie's life is simple now and the aunt's life was hard and but whilst going through this big public you know vote that we were having it was the most awful time in our community's lives and you know it the thing that really made me realise was, one, how lucky I was that this was the first time that I had felt something so awful. And when I was talking about the marriage debate with my uncle, who is a, a gay man who's in his 70s, um, he was just like, this is, you know, this is nothing compared to what it was. Like, 
you know, not in a condescending way, but just in a, this, this is the least bad, you know, debate. He's like, I remember when we were debating it being illegal. So, you know, I remember when we were trying to get people out of jail. I remember, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. And so, yes, it just became very abundantly clear that I couldn't tell my, you know, sweet, lovely, lucky love story without acknowledging that that wouldn't have been possible without, you know, people like him. Mm -hmm. And maybe people don't sort of talk about or acknowledge that um, enough in a way, because I guess there's a few threads to pull out of that. Um, you know, the older generation kind yeah. of paving the way for the younger generation. But then also on the flip side, mm -hmm. you know, you can't just say, oh, well, that taboo has been broken and equality is here and we don't need to discuss it anymore because of course we know that's not true either and then there's of course the idea that no. each individual's experience is also completely unique so that you know you can't make sort of broad generalizations so you do think there's lots of different threads to pull out of making that comparison yeah absolutely and one of the biggest shifts that happened from the play to the film was abby's character in the play abby was much more of just a cool love interest mm. um and yeah it was through really exploring that stuff in in you know my own privilege and realizing that like you know just because it's going to be easy for someone like ellie today it does not mean it's easy one like Abby today and that yes every experience is unique and um and we have so many and there's so many we can celebrate and so many we can talk about but also the you know there's really tough ones out there that we have to acknowledge and we have to look at and we have to you know either keep fighting for them you know there's plenty of members in our community that really need us to keep fighting for them and you know we also definitely need to acknowledge acknowledge our past mm. And maybe we can talk a bit about the comedy element, because obviously, you know, rom-com is there in, in, in the title of the genre. It's obviously um, comedy and romance, but this is really laugh out loud in so many points. And, you know, what do you think can be sort of like, you know, fun, but also challenging about creating a comedy? Um, but also how does it help us tap into maybe, like you say, like maybe getting conversations around the table with families discussing, um, you know, LGBTQ issues, how does comedy help people access those kinds of things without maybe being so on the nose, you know, like some of some other films that might be out there? I think it's a very good point. I think comedy is so important when it comes to talking about anything. It's so sneaky. It's great. People are having a good time and they don't realise why they're having a good time, that you're sneaking in a message at the same time. Um, Look, I think humour, like humour and tragedy go so well together. It's just how we are in life. Like even in our some of our darkest moments, they're our funniest. And, you know, some of our funniest moments are linked to something quite dark. So I just think it's a very, it's a very human experience to be able to laugh. Um, and also laughter is so wonderful. Comedy is so wonderful. And you know, if there is a chance to tell a story through comedy, I will always take it. And do you think there's something specific about Australian comedy? Because I always think, you know, it's all a bit different, isn't it? Like, obviously, we all share the same language, like the US, British comedy, Australian. But there's always something that makes them all a bit unique. And Australian's a bit different to British, but maybe we have lots in common as well. So what do you think makes um, Australian comedy unique? That's really interesting. I think Australian comedy... Uh, particularly the good Australian comedy is very much inspired by British comedy. I can see a lot of, of like where we take our like inspiration from. We're incredibly self-deprecating. Um, we can't stand an achievement. Like we cannot stand um, someone's cess. We hate that. Um, and so I think being able to like um, it, that whole thing of being like we just can't take our seriously. Seriously. And I think that goes really well into like self-effacing comedy. Um, and, you know, as soon as something good happens, you have to acknowledge like something terrible that you've done. Like you cannot have one without the other. You have to be like, I've earned this thing, but like I shouldn't have because like I'm barely adequate at it. Um, so I think, yeah, it's very hard. And also our voices, our voices are just funny. <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, Australia, but our accents are just, 
all over the place. <laughs> And I, I wonder as well, because you do make some nods to kind of like American films. So, you know, were there any of like, you know, mm. the sort of um, high school teen dramas you loved from back in the day from the US? And how do you think you maybe sort of like play upon them a bit, but in the way you say like maybe that cheesy element that sometimes is a bit too common in, in high school films. And that, so you sort of like <laughs> reference them and then also play on them as well. Yes, um, look, I definitely, She's All That was one that I loved um, growing up. I loved that. I was a big, um, like, to all the teen, the Kevin Williams teen stuff. So, like, everything from Dawson's Creek and then Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer. Like, I didn't like horror films, but I just loved, like, that teen high school content. I could not get enough of it. Um, and... Um, you know, and then it, obviously there's, you know, the, the queer ones as well. There's But I'm a Cheerleader and um, uh, Saving Face, although that wasn't really a teen one. That was more a grown-up one. Um, and, you know, so there's obviously there's those great films that were already there, which I have to say I did not discover until I was older. Mm. Um, but it was great to see that other people were out there, like, already trying to do, <laughs> like, doing a very good job of trying to make more films like this. Mm. Um, and yeah, and oh god, what else? All the rom coms, I just love them all. I love all the British, like, I have to say, I love all the Richard Curtis ones, like the Love Actually and the Notting Hill and Bridget Jones. Bridget Jones, what an absolute icon! And like, the one that had the biggest influence on me, which is not in this film in any, well, maybe it is a bit, but was Emma Thompson's Sense and Sensibility. Like that, I think, is the greatest rom-com of all time. A classic. Um, and then maybe you can just talk a bit about your cast, because obviously, I think if you're going to make a comedy, you know, you've got to pick the right cast, haven't you? Because all about the timing, how they deliver the script, you know, that's really going to um, make or break the, the film so you know how did you land on this cast and you know there's some familiar faces I think from like other Australian comedies it feels like there's a bit of a circuit there that you know that pop up um, <laughs> um yeah, how did you land yes, on this? Yes if you love the movie, you'll enjoy this um yeah casting was incredibly incredibly important I think like they say like 90% of directing is casting. And I believe that, like that, that was my main job. Um, so Sophie Hawkshaw, who plays Ellie, she was in the play. So she's been with the project for a very long time. So she knew that character inside out. And then I cast Zoe Tarakis as Abby, who's a brilliant non-binary actor. Um, and they are just, I just can't imagine a better Abby. They're just so wonderful in that role and they bring so much heart and so much personal experience to it. And it's just so incredible to watch. Um, then we have the incredible Marta Dusseldorf, which people like over there might know from either Janet King or A Place to Call Home or Jack Irish or... I don't know, one of the many other thousands of things that Marta has been in. And she's so wonderful because she normally plays very serious roles and she just was dying to do something like this. And that's really what got her on board. She's like, nobody ever asked me to be funny when she's so funny. Um, so that was that was a really good get. Um, and then uh, Rachel House, who plays Aunt Patty, who was a wonderful... New Zealand actress who people might know from all of most of Tyker's films. She loves to pop up. Um, but she, again, incredible comedy actress, incredible comic timing. Um, I was lucky enough to get her because I'd worked as an assistant on something she was on, which I'd gotten her email address years ago. And so sent her an email to be like, hello, do you remember me? And also I've got, I've got something for you. <laughs> Please come to Australia and be in my film. Um, and then Julia Billington, who plays the aunt, who is another brilliant Australian actress, also from Janet King. We've got a huge cast of Janet King people, actually. Zoe Trax is in Janet King. It's like the Janet King reunion show. <laughs> um, and she, <laughs> she's um, just wonderful as the aunt. She's just brilliant. And, yeah, oh, and then there's Bridie Connell as Miss Trimble, everyone's favourite teacher. Um, 
who is like a great Australian comedian and who I've worked with many, many times. And it's just an absolute delight. <laughs> and, you know, it must have been so much fun on set making this film. Did you have any particular highlights? Like were any moments that stood out for you? Um, it was so much fun. We shot this film in like 10 days. So it was an incredibly tight shoot. And so we had to have fun. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one of my highlights, um, there is a scene where Miss Trimble, the teacher, takes the note off Ellie um, that Abby, sorry, the note that Ellie is trying to hide from Abby that has the list of conversation topics. Um, and every time, and Ellie accidentally drops the bomb, and every time Bridie Connell as Miss Trimble d did a different reaction for every take, and it was like, and she always did a slow walk out of the playground, and it was like, you know, all of our extras, it was Ellie, it was Abby, there was the whole crew there, and it was the job of everyone not to laugh, like, and everyone was like biting and crying onto their arms. Like with every reaction she did was just so wonderful in every take. Um, so that was a really good moment. Um, and then also just the formal, the formal scene, seeing the two of them dancing on that oval is just so, it looked beautiful. It looks beautiful on screen. It was a beautiful scene to shoot. And it just, it still is my favorite scene of the whole film. And then I was just wondering, you know, like we were saying, kind of using comedy, but also to tackle, you know, some serious issues or at least kind of highlight, you know, what some of the difficulties might be still of someone coming out in this day and age. You know, how, what do you want people to take away from the film? And kind of how you were mentioning, you know, only 2017, you know, discussing marriage equality. Do you, do you hope that films like this can be part of a longer process of getting people to sort of be more tolerant, be more inclusive, be more open? Um, and do you see that there's progress being made in that respect? Yeah, no, I absolutely do. Um, I see there's a lot of progress, which I find incredibly exciting. Um, it is incredibly easy to forget that, you know, only three years or four years ago now, in Australia, we didn't have marriage equality. Like it's, that's baffling to me now, like things change and then we move on so quickly. It's so easy to forget these things. Um, the biggest thing that I want people to take out of this is how joyful it is and how um, something I didn't really touch on, but a lot of other LGBT films out there that I've loved have a devastating ending. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of, um, a lot of suicide, a lot of people being hidden, there's a lot of secrets, you know, in that kind of stuff. And we need stories about joy. We need queer stories about joy so that young people can see themselves, you know, and see situations that are filled with joy. Um, because if all you're seeing is misery and pain, you, you're not going to aspire to be that. You're going to try and run the other way. And so joy is the biggest thing that I want people to take from this film. Um, and yeah, no, joy, joy is the thing. <laughs> and why do you think that is, like thinking about why so much queer film does maybe kind of focus on tragedy? Do you think it's one of those things where because there was so little representation in the past, there was almost a period of time where it just, those stories needed to be told. There was an urgency to that so that people, other people would understand just how difficult it could be, but then now maybe we're, we can move past that and move to just kind of more regular stories that don't even necessarily make such a big thing about one of the characters being gay or lesbian or, you know, non-binary or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think what I've found in trying to get this film up and get this film made is that a, a lot of the reason that those were the only stories that could, could get told because you know, as the gatekeepers of who gets to say what films get made, that's the only way they could picture that story. Like, you know, it, I, I experienced this a lot themselves being like, you know, they're like, oh, she comes out like straight away in the film. And I was like, yes. And then they're like, and where's the part where she gets like, where she struggles with it and gets bullied. I'm like, that's not what it's about. Yeah. It's about, you know, this relationship. It's almost like they can't picture an interesting story unless it's about someone hiding who they are and then at the climax they reveal and then 
somebody rejects them and then they win them back at the end. It's like that was the only thing they could ever picture. And I think there were a lot of people that had stories like this to tell that wanted to write them, but it was getting people to make them that was so frustrating. And that that definitely is something that I've seen a huge shift in in the last, um, you know, the last, particularly since I wrote this film or since I've made this film. So, you know, 2019, I've just really noticed a real shift in um, people, you know, other people bringing out stories that are really wonderful and also people being interested in hearing, wanting you to hear another story. Like now if you do come in and be like, it's a coming out story, a lot of people are like, oh, we've, do you have something else? Which is great because, yes, we do. We have so many other stories to tell that isn't that one story. Mm. Um, so that's it's really wonderful and it's it's really exciting. So mm. I'm glad that this film gets to kind of be part of that. Yeah. And also it being so female-led because, yes, of course, we have had, mm. you know, bits of that in the past, you know, maybe thinking of things like Bridget Jones or Bridesmaids or, or films like that, but... Um, maybe even in the high school genre, we haven't seen many like female led ones. So is that also something really exciting to be able to put on screen? It's really exciting. It's very exciting. There was one producer who didn't end up making the film that I met with at the beginning and he described it as a dystopian world with no men in it. And I thought, yeah, you shouldn't make the film. Um, <laughs> I was like, hmm, nobody like looks at a Marvel film and it's like, this is a dystopian world where the women are only bit parts. No one would ever say that. So I was like, we're looking through the world through two very different gazes and not one is right and not one is wrong, but mine is certainly not dystopian. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's very exciting. Mm. Um, and then just very quickly, finally, you know, um, it was the first Australian film to open the Mardi Gras Festival, is that right? So, you know, what about the critical reception so far and are you excited for, for the future of this film? I'm so excited. The critical reception has just been amazing. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better, like a better response and a better audience and being able to launch it at the Mardi Gras Film Festival was just it was a dream it was you know like I said I my big thing was like that I couldn't watch a rom-com like you know I wanted to watch a queer rom-com in a cinema with my mum and you know on that night I was watching you know my queer rom-com in a cinema with my mum with 700 other people um pre-pandemic like just before the pandemic um and that like that was a moment that was just not lost on me that was a really incredible moment and so then the fact that people love it and the critical response has been so good has just been an extra wonderful icing on the cake mm. all right well i think i'm out of time but thank you so much for talking with me and congratulations on the oh, film it was so lovely to meet you. for the release yeah it's been really nice to chat to you thanks so much thanks, thanks Sarah. Sarah. Cheers. see you bye, bye.